master's degree in healthcare administration okay. from the University of Scranton. I came back to the Philadelphia area where I completed my orthopedic surgery residency and training here at Rothman Orthopedics at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. And after my residency training, I completed a fellowship in spine surgery at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And this was a, a fairly unique training experience as it's one of the only fully integrated and combined orthopedic and neurosurgical fellowships in the country, meaning that I was trained by both the neurosurgical and orthopedic spine surgeons at the Cleveland Clinic. And I currently serve as an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. As Casey mentioned, I see patients around the Philadelphia area in our Glenn Mills office, as well as in Bluebell and at Wynwood. Uh, and at Wynwood, uh, it's at the Lankanall Medical Center campus. And I currently operate at Riddle Memorial Hospital, Physicians Care Specialty Hospital, and Chester County Hospital in Westchester. So today we're gonna to talk about two common problems that occur in the spine stenosis and radiculopathy. We will define both of these terms and discuss how each of them develop in both the neck and in the low back. We're gonna discuss what the symptoms of each are and how we diagnose and how we treat them. Perfect. Uh, so I just wanna make sure we're on the right slide here. I forgot what we're saying. Uh, so Casey, I think you're a slide ahead of me, which is perfect. So spinal stenosis is the abnormal narrowing of the spinal canal. This is the bony channel or the tube that the spinal cord and nerves live in. In this picture on the screen, I've outlined the spinal canal in red. This is an MRI picture looking at the spine from the side or the sagittal view of the spine. The white area in between the red lines is the spinal fluid that bathes and protects the spinal cord and nerves. The dark structure in the middle of the canal at the red arrow is the end of the spinal cord itself. And below where the orange arrow is are the spinal nerves. I often like to think of the spinal canal as a pipe. And just like an old pipe, things begin to build up around the inside of the spine, making the opening smaller and smaller. And your spine is similar to that old pipe and then over time, things build up on the inside of the canal. And this narrowing comes from the development of bone spurs, disc herniations, degenerative disc disease, and ligament thickening. And just like an old pipe, as it begins to get clogged, signals don't pass as easily through this area, which is narrowed. And that's what leads to patients having symptoms. Next slide, Casey. The next term we're gonna define is radiculopathy. Uh, one more case, there you go. Uh, radiculopathy is the term that we use to describe a pinched nerve. People commonly refer to pains down the leg as a sciatica. And when they refer to a sciatica, they're talking about a pinched nerve in their back that goes from their back all the way down their leg. What really is, this is a spinal nerve root that's getting pinched in the spinal canal or as it exits the spinal canal. This pinching causes the nerve to get irritated and patients can develop pain, numbness, tingling in that area, even weakness, which is, goes where the nerve innervates. We call the area that each nerve travels and provides sensation, it's dermatome. I have a picture on the screen here which shows all the dermatomes of the spinal nerves in the low back, in the chest, and in the neck. So when I'm talking to a patient in the office, I'm trying to figure out which dermatome they're describing and where their pain is. So then when we get imaging or we're trying to evaluate them further that I can make sure that their imaging and their symptoms match up. Now, radiculopathy is commonly caused by disc herniations, degenerative disc disease, arthritis, or even spinal stenosis itself. Next slide. Next, we're gonna talk about how lumbar stenosis and radiculopathy occur in the low back or in the lumbar spine. Next slide. So lumbar stenosis, again, is the abnormal narrowing of the spinal canal in the low back. Once again, in the picture, you can see on the screen that the nerves in the low back are getting compressed toward the bottom of the spinal canal. You can see at the arrow that there is no spinal fluid or white area around the nerves, and this is an area of spinal stenosis. Now that we know what lumbar stenosis is, we can talk about what the symptoms are that patients develop and how they typically present to my office. Next slide. So how do people typically present? Well, patients will come in and they'll complain of having leg pain or back pain or both. Usually it's been going on for some time and they've tried some treatment on their own that hasn't gotten better. Frequently, they'll tell me that they have difficulty walking and they cannot walk as far as they used to. Some patients will even feel that their legs are getting heavy and they're dragging them and that they have difficulty doing the activities that they used to do or that they enjoy. Patients will often come into my office and be bent forward or leaning forward as they walk. 
Sometimes the patients themselves won't even notice that they do this, but family members or friends will point it out that they're leaning forward. Patients will also tell me that when they try to stand up straight, it makes their pain worse, or when they try to go down the steps or walk down a hill, their symptoms get worse. Often they find that sitting down or leaning forward help to alleviate their symptoms. And we can see in the picture here, a normal spinal canal, you can see the nerves have plenty of room around them. Whereas in the stenotic picture on the right, all the nerves look like they're grouped together and they're squished together. And that's what causes the symptoms in spinal stenosis. So what other symptoms can occur? Patients can get pain, as we just said, that can be in the back and down the legs. They can get numbness, which can go down the legs or be in the feet, as well as tingling in those areas. Patients who have severe compression can develop weakness in one or more muscle groups of the legs, and they can get muscle cramps as associated with their stenosis. Patients with lumbar stenosis tend to get a, a syndrome or a series of symptoms, a group of symptoms that we call a neurogenic claudication. And neurogenic claudication is when patients will get buttock pain, they can get pain down their legs, they can feel heaviness in their legs, like it's difficult to walk, and they find it difficult to walk long distances. Next slide. Interestingly enough, there's a phenomenon called the shopping cart sign. And the shopping cart sign is, is something interesting. When I talk to patients who tell me they have difficulty walking, I'll often ask them, do you ever go to the grocery store and are able to walk with the shopping cart? And people will often say, yes, actually, that's funny that you say that. I do notice that if I go to the grocery store, I can get everything I need in the store uh, and I don't have to stop. And that's because I'm pushing the cart. And the reason that is, is because as we lean forward, we are able to open up the back of the spine, which alleviates pressure and opens up the, the space in the, for the nerves in the back of the spinal canal. When we stand up, we lose that ability to stretch that area out and our symptoms get worse. So people who are able to lean on the shopping cart are often able to make it much further. Next slide. So how or why does stenosis occur? Well, it's a degenerative process for the most part, which means that over time, just like the rest of our bodies, our spine ages and develops wear and tear. The disc, which is the main shock absorber of the spine, starts to get flat. We commonly use the analogy of a jelly donut when we're describing the disc because it's made of a dense fibro cartilage on the outside, where the inside is made of a gelatinous substance or a jelly-like substance that helps our body move and it helps to absorb the stress of our daily lives. But just like that jelly donut, over time, the disc can get stale. It dries out. It begins to crack a little bit. And sometimes even jelly will squirt out in a place that it's not supposed to. In addition to issues with the disc getting older, we also start to develop arthritis in the small joints in the back of the spine, which are called the facet joints. And these joints are like any other joints in our body, like our knees and our hips, they can wear out over time and they can develop bone spurs. And what happens is when we develop bone spurs in the facet joints, they actually form in the area where the, the uh, spinal canal is and it makes that area for the nerves smaller. They can also form in the area where the nerves leave the spine called the neural foramen and that can also cause patients to have more symptoms. Next slide. Some people will develop stenosis for another reason, and they'll develop stenosis due to abnormal motion or alignment of the bones of their spine. Spondylolisthesis is the phrase that we use for when the bones of the spine don't line up, and one of the bones shifts forward on the bone below it. This causes a kink in the spinal canal, making it smaller at that particular point. In the picture here, we can see that there's two red lines. And the top red line, which represents the back of the L4 body, is in front of the red line below it, which is the back of the L5 body. And this causes an area of stenosis at the L4-5 disc space, or the L4-5 level. And we can see here that there's no white fluid behind, uh, uh, in the spinal canal behind those uh, vertebral bodies, which is causing stenosis at that level. And believe it or not, this area where the two vertebrae don't line up is actually fairly common. And spondylolisthesis is thought to be present in about 6% of the adult population. And it's more common in females than it is in males. Next slide. Next, we're going to talk about lumbar radiculopathy. And lumbar radiculopathy, as we talked about earlier, is commonly referred to as a sciatica. And this is when a nerve gets pinched or compressed as it begins to leave the spinal canal. This usually results in pain, numbness, and tingling going down the leg, and it follows the path of the nerve. On the screen here, we can see a picture of the different nerves of the lumbar spine. Now, each of these nerves innervates a different part of the leg, and when I talk to patients, I'm often trying to figure out where their pain is so I can try to correlate it to which nerve is most likely getting pinched. 
This is important as we begin to think about different treatment strategies, as we want to make sure that we're treating the proper nerve that's causing pain in each patient. Next slide. So what are the symptoms of lumbar radiculopathy? Well, like we said, it can cause pain that goes down the leg and it follows the path of where the nerve innervates. It can cause numbness in that area or sometimes in just part of that area, as well as tingling, and it can cause weakness in the muscles that that particular nerve innervates. Next slide. One of the common causes of lumbar radiculopathy is a herniated disc. And I've mentioned that a few times, but what is a herniated disc? A herniated disc is when the jelly or the nucleus pulposus, it's called, of that jelly donut or of that disc gets pushed out into the spinal canal or into the foramen, which is the tunnel where the nerve leaves. Now, not only does this jelly cause compression and kind of squeeze the nerve, which can cause pain, but the substance of the jelly donut um, itself is very irritative and very inflammatory, and it can cause a significant amount of pain. And that's why patients who have a herniated disc tend to develop a significant amount of pain when it occurs, because not only do they get compression, but they get this inflammatory response, which irritates the nerve even further. Next slide. Now, it's important to note radiculopathy and stenosis can occur at the same time. Radiculopathy may actually be the presenting symptom of somebody who has underlying stenosis. However, in other patients, patients may develop a herniated disc without other degenerative features or issues going on and may have an isolated radiculopathy or an isolated sciatica. So what happens, uh, next slide, when you come to our office? Next slide, yep. So when we come to the office, it all starts with a history and physical. I really like to talk to patients to figure out when did this pain start? Have you had this before and it went away? Where do you feel the pain? Can you trace it out with your hand? How are you walking? I like patients to get up and to try to walk in the office so I can see, are they walking with a limp? Is there any weakness in the leg that I think is causing some of their symptoms? And then I'll test each of the major muscle groups in the legs and the arms to make sure that there's no weakness developing, uh, which can be another sign of a nerve getting irritated. And then I think most importantly, the other thing that I like to do in the office is I try to find other reasons that patients could be having this pain other than their back. When we talk about issues in the lumbar spine, you know, I frequently think about patients who develop hip bursitis, which is when you get irritation around the sides of your hips, kind of at your hip bone at the top, uh, which can be quite painful for patients uh, and be a significant source of, of issues with quality of life. And then other patients will have hip arthritis, and sometimes hip arthritis can even cause pain that goes all the way down to almost the knee. Uh, so I like to make sure that we check the hips uh, and for other areas that could be causing problems other than the lumbar spine when you come in to see me for your spine to make sure that we're treating the right thing. Next slide. Often when we're seeing patients, you know, our imaging uh, studies will begin with an x-ray. And I get an x-ray of where I think the pain is coming from in the spine. When we get x-rays, really the main goal is to look at the alignment of the bones. Is there a scoliosis where there's a deformity present or is there a spondylolisthesis like we talked about and two bones aren't lined up? Also, we can't see a disc on x-rays, but what we can see is the space in between the bones. The space in between the bones is where the disc lives. So we can use it as a proxy for how healthy the disc is. I like to make sure that all the discs are about the same size or about the size that they should be depending on the age of the patient. This can be a clue of underlying arthritis or spondylosis, as we say, uh, of the lumbar spine. Next slide. Patients will often ask me, why don't we get an MRI on everyone as soon as they come in? And the main reason this is, is because patients will have findings on their MRI that are not necessarily causing them a problem. There are several studies that have highlighted this phenomenon, but one of the studies that I have listed here is very well quoted. And Dr. Bowden, what he did was he looked at patients who had no history of any back problems, no leg pain, no back pain, no signs of neurogenic claudication, and he got MRIs of all of their lumbar spines. And what he found was that in patients over the age of 60, 57% of them had abnormal MRIs, 36% of which had a herniated disc that was present, and 21% actually had asymptomatic spinal stenosis. In patients that were younger than 60, a third of them had abnormal MRIs, 20% of those patients had a herniated disc, and one patient actually had asymptomatic spinal stenosis. And when we, he looked at even younger patients between the age of 20 and 39, 35% of those patients had some kind of finding on their imaging, including like a disc bulge or small disc herniation. 
And all these patients had no signs or symptoms of having any issues. And so we usually reserve our MRIs to patients who have persistent symptoms or things that are not getting better. So when do we typically get that MRI? Like I said, it's when patients have persistent symptoms and they have tried kind of the baseline treatments and they're not getting better. Uh, however, sometimes we get an MRI sooner if patients are developing weakness in one of the muscle groups of the legs or if they have so-called red flag symptoms. And these include bowel and bladder incontinence that happen acutely or saddle anesthesia, meaning that when patients go to the bathroom, they can't feel themselves wiping. These are conditions that we get very concerned about and we get an MRI very quickly uh, because we wanna make sure that if there is something going on that we treat it um, expeditiously. And when, again, all the while when we get the MRI, we're trying to make sure the patient's symptoms and the way that they're describing them match up with what we find on imaging. Next slide. So what are the treatments that we provide for patients who have spine conditions? Next slide. So here at Rothman, we pride ourselves on taking a team-based approach to caring for our patients with spinal conditions. We have a dedicated team of surgeons, non-operative spine physicians, and physical therapists that provide our patients with the full spectrum of treatments. Next slide. Now, the first-line treatment for patients with almost any spine condition is oral anti-inflammatory medications such as steroids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or prescription Mobic. The goal of these drugs is to help bring down inflammation that's around the nerves to try to alleviate symptoms. All the while, we also usually begin patients in physical therapy. And the goal of therapy is really to help strengthen patient's core and to help use muscles to stabilize that area of the spine that's being inflamed. The good news for everybody out there is that 90% or more of patients will get better without surgery and the vast majority get better with just these first line basic treatments. Next slide. However, for patients that have symptoms that are progressive or not getting better with physical therapy and anti-inflammatory medications, the next line of treatment typically involves getting an injection with one of my non-operative physician partners. Now the injection is both diagnostic and therapeutic. And what I mean by that is that it helps us to target the nerve on imaging that correlates with the patient's history and we provide steroid numbing medication to that area to try to alleviate and target the symptoms. And if we're able to alleviate the symptoms that help can, helps us confirm that that's the area that is causing an issue, all the while we're able to provide significant relief for patients. Next slide. However, some patients will continue to have symptoms despite our best efforts with non-operative treatment. And surgery is really only indicated when patients feel that they have failed non-operative care and their symptoms are progressing to a point that it's affecting their quality of life sufficiently to the point that they wish to have it corrected. Now, surgery, the goal of surgery is to make more room for the nerves to alleviate the patient's symptoms. And we choose our surgical options based on each individual patient and what their MRI shows and what their pathology is. Now, there's multiple treatment options depending on each patient's needs. In this picture, you can see a lumbar laminectomy, which is when we remove the back, uh, the bone in the back of the spine that's causing compression on the nerves, as well as the bone spurs and the ligaments that are making less room for the nerves. And this can provide patients with pretty significant relief. Next slide. However, in some patients, they have a spondylolisthesis. So they have a abnormal motion or alignment of the spine. And in addition to performing that decompression or that laminectomy, we have to fuse the spine because if we don't, then that abnormal motion will continue and cause their symptoms to recur. This is a picture of somebody who had a, spond a spondylolisthesis at the L4-5 level who went on to have a L4-5 lumbar decompression and instrumented fusion to alleviate their symptoms. Next slide. One other option is a microdiscectomy. And this is usually reserved for patients who have a herniated disc or an isolated lumbar radiculopathy. And in these patients they, who have failed non-operative treatment and they have a disc herniation or a disc bulge that's continually ir irritating a nerve root, what we can do is we can do a smaller decompression where we take away some of the bone and some of the ligament so that we're able to take out that little piece of disc that's pushing on the nerve to alleviate their symptoms. And this works great for patients with isolated radiculopathy who fail non-operative treatment. Next slide. Next, we're gonna talk about how stenosis and radiculopathy occur in the neck or in the cervical spine. Next slide. So cervical stenosis, again, is abnormal narrowing of the spinal canal, but this time it's in the neck. 
the difference between lumbar stenosis and cervical stenosis is that in the neck, instead of compressing the nerves uh, like it does in the low back, stenosis begins to compress on the spinal cord itself. Next slide. In cases where the spinal cord is getting pinched, patients can develop a syndrome called cervical myelopathy. And cervical myelopathy is when the spinal cord begins to get damaged from being compressed. And this results in a chronic progressive decline in patient's function as a result of this ongoing damage and compression to the spinal cord. And believe it or not, the mean age for patients to develop the symptoms of cervical myelopathy is, is 56, meaning that this is not a disease that only happens in older patients, but this really can happen at any age group, uh, and particularly in younger patients uh, and middle-aged patients as well. Next slide. So how does cervical myelopathy develop? How does it present? Well, typically, it's a slow onset. It's a, it's a progressive decline in function, meaning that patients have this insidious or slow onset of symptoms that they don't necessarily always correlate with their neck. And to make matters worse, about 30% of patients may have painless cervical myelopathy, meaning that they have no neck pain, they don't have any arm pain, but they start to develop the signs of spinal cord dysfunction. Spinal cord dysfunction and cervical myelopathy starts with either hand numbness or patients will slowly start to develop uh, more and more balance issues. People will find that getting dressed gets more difficult or they're nervous opening doors. They have trouble walking uh, just in normal day-to-day -day life. Patients will also find that their hand dexterity is affected and they can't do the um, tasks that they used to do. Buttoning shirts becomes more difficult, zipping up jackets, and some patients will experience even handwriting problems. Next slide. Now, why is cervical myelopathy different than lumbar stenosis? Well, it's a progressive spinal cord dysfunction and damage. And multiple studies have shown that patients with chronic untreated cervical myelopathy actually develop permanent damage to the, to the nerves within the spinal cord itself, to the gray and the white matter. And multiple studies have further demonstrated that patients who have symptomatic cervical myelopathy will develop worsening function over time meaning that as this compression is present, patients will continue to have a decline in their function, meaning their balance will get worse, their hand function will get worse, uh, and their hand numbness could get worse as well. And the, the problem that we face as spine surgeons and spine providers is that we're not very good at identifying how fast patients will develop worsening symptoms. And we've looked at this multiple times, but we find a very variable uh, rate of, of progression in patients that we're not really good at predicting. And what's our goal of treating patients with cervical myelopathy? So the goal of treating cervical myelopathy is to stop symptoms from getting worse. We know that most patients who undergo treatment for cervical myelopathy will see improvement in their symptoms. However, the amount of improvement is very variable. So we try to intervene on patients as early as possible because we wanna prevent their symptoms from progressing and getting worse because we're unsure in which patients they're gonna have significant improvement after treatment. Next slide. The other problem that we talked about is cervical radiculopathy. Now, cervical radiculopathy is similar to lumbar radiculopathy, and it refers to a pinched nerve or when a spinal nerve root is getting compressed in the area where it leaves the spine. This usually results in pain that's going down the arm or the shoulder, and it follows the path of the nerve. This can result in numbness and tingling in the arm, weakness in one of the muscle groups, uh, and as you can see on the screen here, different nerves control different areas of the skin. So again, when we're talking to patients in the office, I'm trying to figure out what area they're describing their pain in and which uh, dermatone or which nerve they're describing. And the causes of cervical radiculopathy are disc herniations, degenerative disc disease, and cervical stenosis. Next slide. So what happens when during your visit for your cervical spine? Next slide. So just like in the lumbar spine, it all starts with a history and physical exam. When did this start? How are you feeling? Um, when, uh, what have you done to treat this so far? I ask patients to try to draw out the pain that they feel. Um, and so I can try to get an idea of which dermatome they're describing. Again, because I'm always concerned about cervical myelopathy, we have patients get up and walk. I want to check their balance and see how, they're, uh, how they uh, operate in space. And then I want to check each of the major muscle groups in their arms and legs and check their reflexes. And then again, just like in the lower extremity, I always look for other causes that could be uh, mimicking uh, cervical issues, such as 
uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, which can cause patients to have hand numbness, or cubital tunnel syndrome, which can cause uh, numbness and pain in other areas of the arm. Uh, and then for patients uh, that may develop rotator cuff tears, sometimes they'll have pain that almost feels like it's radiating down their arm. So we check all of these things to make sure that we're actually looking at the right cause of people's pain in the office. Next slide. And just like in the lumbar spine, we'll get x-rays of the neck to evaluate the patient's alignment. Is there a scoliosis within the neck or a deformity? Is there a spondylolisthesis that may be contributing to a patient's symptoms? And we look at the disc height. Are they symmetric between all the different levels? Uh, or is there some underlying disc disease or arthritis that's developing that may be contributing to their symptoms? Next slide. So when do we get an MRI in the cervical spine? Well, an MRI is typically warranted when patients have persist persistent symptoms or they start to develop weakness in a part of the arm. I also, we also get an MRI quicker uh, if we're concerned for myelopathy, because again, we want to intervene sooner for patients who have my myelopathy uh, as, you know, it's uh, the sooner we can intervene, uh, hopefully the better treatment the patient will have uh, going forward. Next slide. So what are the treatments for patients with cervical conditions? Next slide. So once again, here at Rothman, we take the same team-based approach, uh, and we have a, a dedicated team of non-operative physicians, physical therapists, and surgeons who are able to treat patients and provide them with a full spectrum of treatment options. Next slide. Just like in the lumbar spine, the first-line treatment for patients with cervical conditions is anti-inflammatory medications, such as uh, steroids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or prescription Mobic and physical therapy. And again, the goal of physical therapy here is to stabilize the area around the neck and the shoulders and work on the core to help uh, alleviate um, inflammation and stabilize the areas of the spine. And just like in the lumbar spine, the good news for patients is that the majority of patients will get better with just this first line treatment. Uh, and that will be all that they need. Next slide. However, some patients will have progressive symptoms or they won't get better with physical therapy and anti-inflammatory medications. And again, the next line treatment, just like in the lumbar spine, could be an injection with one of my non-operative spine partners. The goal of the injection, again, is both diagnostic and therapeutic. It helps us to target the nerves on the imaging and from the patient's histories that we think are being irritated. And by providing some steroid to that area and numbing medication, we're able to ensure that we're targeting and treating the right area. And again, this allows us to provide patients uh, with significant relief for their symptoms. Next slide. I wanted to take a second here to talk about cervical myelopathy in particular. So the treatment options for cervical myelopathy really depend on the severity of the symptoms or the severity of myelopathy that patients present with. For early or mild cervical myelopathy, the treatment options are largely the same as I mentioned before, physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medications, lifestyle modifications can be helpful, as well as epidural injections, meaning that if patients don't have a significant amount of compression uh, and we can are able to provide patients with an epidural injection in the neck, then we will do that. But these are the patients I like to follow closely. These are the patients I'm concerned will develop a progressive myelopathy, and I like to see them back on a regular basis just to make sure their symptoms aren't progressing. Uh, because as I said, in cervical myelopathy, we wanna intervene earlier rather than later to try to optimize patients' um, uh, quality of life. Next slide. So for patients with moderate to severe myelopathy that are having significant symptoms that are impacting their quality of life, uh, surgery is an option for those patients. Now the goal of surgery is to make more room for the spinal cord and stop the progression of cervical myelopathy. There's multiple different treatment options, and those options are based on which treatment is best for that particular patient and that, base, uh, that particular patient's pathology. We have anterior-based surgeries where we do surgery through the front of the neck, and we have uh, posterior-based surgeries where we go in uh, through the back of the neck. Next slide. So one of the more common procedures that we perform is called an anterior cervical discectomy infusion, or an ACDF. The goal of this surgery is to remove the compression on the spinal cord and nerves by removing the disc herniation and bone spurs from the back of the uh, vertebral body. And we replace the disc with a piece of bone graft that's gonna allow us to fuse the two bones of the spine and make them one bone. We place a small plate and screws typically on the front of the spine, as you can see in this picture here, which helps us to aid in, in the fusion uh, of this level. We can actually do this at one level or we can do this at multiple levels depending on what each patient needs. 
Next slide. Some patients, however, their pathology warrants going from the back of the spine. And in this case, we do a posterior decompression and instrumented fusion. And this is when we perform a laminectomy, like we talked about in the lumbar spine, and we remove the bone in the back of the spine, as well as the ligament, uh, to, to take pressure off of the nerves in the spinal cord itself. In this case, we typically fuse the spine because we're afraid the patients will develop instability or a deformity in their neck if it's not fused because there's so much motion in the cervical spine. Next slide. And one of the other common procedures that I perform is a laminoplasty. And a laminoplasty is a procedure that allows for decompression of the spinal cord at multiple levels uh, through a posterior approach to the neck. And this actually does not require a fusion. So patients are able to maintain their motion while we are able to decompress their spinal cord. Uh, this has a, a more strict criteria of for which patients are candidates for this type of an operation. Uh, but when patients are candidates, this works very well. Next slide. And for patients who fail non-operative treatment that have a cervical radiculopathy or that pinched nerve that's going down their arm, there are surgical options. Uh, these mostly include, again, an anterior cervical discectomy fusion, which we described earlier. And for some patients who, mit, who meet strict criteria, uh, cervical disc replacement can be a good option for these patients. Uh, and that allows us to remove that herniated disc or, or a piece of bone that's causing irritation of the spinal nerve and uh, allow patients to keep their motion. Next slide. So in closing, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in closing, stenosis and radiculopathy are two of the most common causes of pain and decline in function for many patients. The majority of patients will get better without the need for surgery. Uh, and recognizing these signs and symptoms and seeing a medical provider can help you to improve your pain and function. And I would implore everyone, if you do have symptoms, to come uh, to see us and to be evaluated and know that the majority of patients will get better without surgery. Uh, but we are here to help walk you through the process and take care of you along the way and get you back to uh, functioning and, and pain-free or as painless as possible. So thank you very much. Next slide. I'm happy to answer any questions that may uh, have come up. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Mangan. That was really good information. Um, I love how you explained how uh, Rothman, the Rothman team works um, through the process that the patient will see. Um, all right, so we have a couple questions. Um, how long can you get lumbar epidural shots? Can you get them for many years if they are helping you? Yeah, that's a great question. And I always tell people, you know, surgery is uh, the last resort for patients who have spinal conditions. And if patients are having significant improvement with epidural injections, uh, they can certainly get uh, several a year um, and for multiple years in a row. Um, you know, surgery is, it's a patient decision uh, and it's a decision that we make as a, as a team together. Uh, so if injections are helping, I always tell patients that they can keep getting the injections if they're providing them with relief. Um, you know, there's no rush for surgery as long as their symptoms aren't getting worse. Um, but yes, you can get them for, for multiple years. Uh, if that's helping you, that's, that's totally okay. We usually limit the amount of people, uh, the amount of injections somebody can get a year, just because there is steroid involved, and we won't want to give them too much cortisone. Um, but but that really varies uh, by provider, uh, and I would defer to our non-operative surgeon uh, providers for how many a year people can get. Great. Next question. I understand that both orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons operate on the spine. For what conditions or under what circumstances would a patient choose orthopedic over neuro for spine surgery? Are there specific areas of expertise or differences in approach? I think that's a great question. I think that's a question that comes up for a lot of patients. Um, you know, I think today, you know, most orthopedic and neurosurgeons are, are trained in the same uh, kind of vernacular of, of surgery. And most uh, neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons are well-versed in uh, performing all of the basic procedures uh, in the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine that patients need. Um, I, I think, you know, largely it's a comfort level for patients. I think that uh, neurosurgical uh, spine surgeons are better at dealing with, or they only deal with typically, uh, when there's a problem within the spinal cord itself, uh, meaning that you have to have surgery on the spinal cord or one of the nerves. Uh, we usually defer to our neurosurgical colleagues for that. 
However, for uh, degenerative conditions of the lumbar spine or the cervical spine, like we talked about today, I think it's patient preference and patient comfort. I think uh, most orthopedic and neurosurgeons are able to provide patients with uh, the same level of expertise uh, in those treatment strategies. Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording real quick.